Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I would like to tell you a little story about uh, competition and what you can learn from, uh, from participating in the competition. Uh, so um, I'm a game developer. Um, I'm uh, working on uh, creating games. I also have um, a few other activities, uh, sending out a newsletter, um, organizing the mentioned competition. Uh, and some uh, meetups and workshops in Poland. Uh, I'm also a Mozilla tech speaker. Uh, and um, uh, the, the history of the JS 13K Games competition started in 2012. Uh, it was the first year when uh, the competition <coughs> happened. And there was the On the Game Start conference. Uh, somebody probably heard about it. Um, it's a competition uh, that was focusing on HTML5 game development. Um, and during the competition, uh, I announced the winners of the first edition. So uh, it was also the time when the Enclave Games came to life, the company in which I'm, I'm building games. And the JS13K Games competition uh, is a JavaScript um, competition for game developers. Uh, how many of you uh, write JavaScript? Okay. Uh, so uh, it's, um, the, the competition is for JavaScript developers. Uh, you can learn JavaScript pretty, pretty quickly and easily uh, if you want to uh, participate but you have no idea how to, how to write JavaScript. Uh, anyway, the competition is pretty hardcore because uh, you have to create a game uh, within the 13 kilobytes limit. So uh, there are um, pages of the games um, when, in which they have like small images, small screenshots of the games, like 100 per 200 pixels, and those images are bigger than the games themselves. So it's, it's, it's pretty hardcore. All the assets, everything, uh, music, uh, graphic assets, um, and the source code have to be uh, squeezed into the 13 kilobytes zip package. Uh, and the, uh, the, the competition is happening once a year online. Uh, you have a whole month to, uh, to create a game. And I'm gonna talk, about, talk a little bit more about uh, the, the competition. Um, there are competitions in which you don't have any prizes. In this one, you have like a whole bunch of them. Uh, usually it's $20,000 worth of prizes, which is kind of surprising because most of them are uh, licenses, eBooks, um, etc. Uh, but it's quite easy to uh, quite easy to get the prizes from the uh, from the developers uh, and the companies. So uh, um, I'm giving that every basically every single year. And uh, apart from that, uh, there is also a free T-shirt uh, every year to anyone who participate. Uh, so there is a tradition of sending free T-shirts uh, worldwide to all the participants. Uh, so many people participate just for the t-shirt. Uh, well, it works. Why not? Uh, of course, if you win the competition, you will earn uh, fame and fortune. Uh, the fame will come quickly. The fortune, you'll have to work for that, but it can happen eventually. And the interesting thing is that uh, it sounds like 13 kilobytes is pretty small, but uh, if you focus specifically on the task of creating something uh, for this 
specific limit, um, it's surprisingly easy to, uh, to find tools to create something. And uh, the limit itself uh, spawns creativity because uh, usually uh, if you have like a generic competition, with, uh, even without the theme, um, it's really hard to stop thinking about ideas. But if you have uh, uh, the, the competition have uh, the theme announced every single year, uh, so you have to really think creatively with what you have. Uh, you won't create uh, every type of game uh, within the limit, so it's, uh, you have to get creative. And the, the cool thing about the competition, the, the, I think the coolest one, is that um, all the source code, every, every single game created over the years, uh, with it, uh, and they are, there are like 800 uh, games already uh, submitted over the years. Every single one is available on GitHub because uh, you have, when you participate, you have to submit a, a compressed version uh, through the form, uh, but you also have to provide readable, commented version on GitHub. So basically, if you want to see how any of the games were created, uh, all the source code of every single game is available on GitHub. Uh, so you can basically check how something was created and, and learn from that. Um, so that, that's, that, that is uh, quite important for me and I'm, I'm trying to keep the uh, tradition of, uh, um, of allowing people not only to participate and earn prizes, but also learn from one another. Uh, the difference between the usual competitions or hackathons or game jams is that a game jam usually uh, lasts for one day or two days straight, like 48 hours uh, during the weekend, uh, while the JS 13K games competition uh, lasts for a month. Uh, so there were cases in which uh, people were going out for vacations for two weeks, getting back, uh, still having some vacations and uh, uh, being able to work on the game submitted to the competition and, for example, get back to work. Um, so there is plenty of, uh, there's plenty of time uh, to create a game uh, for the competition, even though it's a uh, holiday season. Uh, the interesting thing is that, as I mentioned, it's, uh, the 13 kilobytes is pretty small, but uh, people who actually uh, created a game for the competition, uh, many of them uh, were saying that uh, not the size was the problem, but um, they were running out of time faster than <laughs> running out of space, um, considering all the tools uh, and everything uh, they can use to, to build a game. Uh, so it's, um, it's, even though you have a whole month, you have to plan it properly. Or if you have less than a month, you have to plan it properly to, to execute everything you want to do. Uh, so 13 kilobytes is a lot with a specific mindset. Uh, I'm gonna skip the HTML and I mean, I, I'm gonna go pretty quickly through the examples. If you're not familiar with HTML and JavaScript, I'm just gonna mention that there are techniques um, in which you can uh, squeeze the size of the source code. Uh, for example, in HTML, um, you can omit some tags uh, and the browser will um, fill them automatically for you. Uh, to have the best uh, compression of the whole source code, um, the common approach is to have everything in one, uh, in one file, an HTML file, in which you include uh, the, JavaScript file, the, the JavaScript source code, HTML, CSS, and everything else. Uh, so we can also embed images as base64 images. So they are also part of the one file, so it compresses uh, better than if you have images uh, separately. So that's one of the techniques people usually use uh, during the competition. Uh, the funny thing I came uh, to is 
uh, when you define uh, a data for, the, for your levels, uh, you can omit many things like you don't have to have zeros and ones, you don't even have uh, the commas because um, all of that will be filled automatically. Uh, you can also generate sounds. Uh, you can think that um, a usual MP3 will have like five megabytes or something like that, and it would be hard to squeeze it into 13 kilobytes. Uh, but there are tools which can help you generate sounds, generate music, and it, it looks pretty strange, but it works. Uh, and you can pretty easily create uh, music and sounds even though you're not a sound designer. So the important thing when creating for the competition is that um, you can't have um, too many different assets. So um, usually it's a lot easier to generate uh, a lot of stuff uh, procedurally. Uh, so for example, if there, is a, there was a dating game, like dating simulator or something, and uh, all the faces of the people were generated um, through the JavaScript code. Uh, so um, none of the images were used. So it would be a lot, um, the, the game would, um, would be a lot bigger uh, when someone would uh, use um, images and it would be harder to add more, uh, more faces to the game because you would have to create them uh, yourself while um, if the faces or, or anything else basically uh, were generated, uh, it, the, the source code could be mo easily modified uh, to have more variety or, or more faces or whatever. Um, it was also used for, uh, for levels, for dungeons, uh, and all the crazy stuff people created uh, in the competition. Uh, you don't have to do that yourself from scratch. Uh, there are many tools uh, created before the competition or created by people participating in the competition uh, that, you can, um, that you can use. Uh, there is a special page uh, on which there is a huge amount of, oh, not this one, also not this one, this one. Uh, so the, the list is quite long um, and it consists of uh, some frameworks, tools to create sound and music as I mentioned, artwork and fonts, uh, some tools to help you minify the source code, etc, etc. Uh, so it's pretty long. And um, so it, it helps you if you have absolutely no idea where to start. Um, those tools can help you out. Uh, there is a section of the post-mortems. Uh, those are blog posts of people who already participated in the competition. And they are writing uh, what went good, what went bad, uh, when they developed the game. Uh, and you can also learn from them, uh, basically, what tools did they use, if it was a good choice or a bad one. Uh, so I highly recommend uh, checking the, the post-mortems and all the tools. Uh, you can have, um, this is an example setup um, of, um, uh, of a game, of the actual game called, called Galactic uh, Backfire, in which the developer uh, used the Contra microlibrary for managing uh, the JavaScript, um, uh, created the artwork with uh, Pico 8 editor, um, generated sounds with uh, JS Fixer, um, also had some music um, and used the AdZip for, for minification. So uh, those are the tools, you can use those, you can use uh, other tools that are on the website, um, on the list. Um, it basically doesn't matter. Um, you can choose uh, one because of some preferences or because someone else uses it. Um, but the, 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 the point is, uh, there are many uh, tools to choose from. Uh, there are different techniques which are usually not recommended in day-to-day -day development. 
Um, for example, somebody was replacing math.p with uh, p variable because it's shorter, so it takes less uh, characters. Um, they were removing the, 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 ta the HTML tags I mentioned previously because like, the page will work anyway uh, and uh, the rendering engine will, um, will render this uh, automatically for you. Uh, the usual way was to have your um, variables uh, shorter, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the most hardcore example was um, someone was missing one byte to uh, finish the game within the limit. So the uh, game over message wasn't actually game over, it was game over without the space. Uh, and but it worked, so I wouldn't recommend trying that uh, in your uh, projects. Uh, but if you want to try um, this hardcore competition, it's it's even recommended. Uh, I mentioned about the postmortems. Uh, you can read from people who already participated. Uh, there are many cool stories. Uh, which tools you can use, which to avoid, or uh, what you should um, think about when choosing those. Um, so if, if you want to know uh, how this looks like, um, you, can, you can check what uh, other people uh, were writing. And um, one thing I realized um, is that reading through all the experiences of people participating in the competition, I kind of relate uh, with what they are saying, what are their conclusions, um, and uh, what were my lessons learned from running the game dev studio or even working as a front-end developer. Uh, so everything that will be after this slide is either um, something people participating in the competition learned, or I learned running the studio, or I, or I learned uh, um, as a front-end developer, and it kind of uh, mix all together. So the, the first, and I think the most important thing is scope, because uh, you can't build an MMORPG uh, within the limit, and even if you are not participating in the competition, it's basically not a good idea either. Um, I know way too many uh, developers who had absolutely no idea how much work uh, is uh, on building a game, and they decided, okay, so let's build World of Warcraft, but better. Um, and after like two or five years, they say that yeah, making games pretty hard. Um, so uh, the the perfect example for for the scope is the Gribble game, which won uh, last year or two years ago, um, which with which the the developer um, when he was creating the game. Um, he decided to make it way too big um, and um, he had to throw away a lot of uh, features, uh, a lot of source code. So I think it's the only example that is against this rule because the game ended up pretty well, uh, pretty high. Um, but most of the projects uh, are either incomplete and are even not submitted to the competition or people have uh, problems uh, finishing the games. So it's, um, it's a lot easier to start from the smaller game and add uh, features to that. So it's important to have a prototype as soon as possible. Uh, and if you can build a prototype, a working prototype in the first few hours, uh, it's a good sign that you can actually finish something for the competition. Uh, the perfect example is the game Lost, uh, which is from, uh, from 2017, in which um, someone created a game which is a snake. 
basically. Uh, so it's among the easiest um, and basic game ideas ever. Uh, and it still ended up pretty high. Uh, I'm gonna explain why uh, in the next slides, but basically the developer have created the, the, the working prototype and he was basically uh, spamming with uh, next versions all the time asking for feedback. So the game uh, itself um, evolved uh, quite nice and um, he had the working, uh, working version every single time when he was adding some features. Um, so if, if, uh, if you could compare the, the first prototype with the finished version, it's absolutely different. Uh, but at every single point in time, uh, he could finish the competition and submit the game. Uh, something I learned uh, pretty hard was that um, your game will never be perfect. Uh, there is a story of me talking about building Wizard Quest and the, the, the presentation title is how to make a simple game in four years. Uh, because I wanted to have my game uh, as perfect as possible uh, and I have rewritten it like seven times at least because it was created from, uh, in pure JavaScript then using jQuery which was like, I don't know, 30 years ago or something like that. Uh, then I learned that there is a, a phaser framework, oh sorry, uh, the impact.js framework first. Then I learned about phaser. And then I decided that maybe I could rewrite the whole structure in phaser again and again. So basically that's the worst idea ever. Um, if you want to try with something else with a different approach, with a different tool, I would suggest to finish the first one, release it, uh, and try to work on the next one. Uh, because it's better to have like, I don't know, five or 10 or 15 games finished uh, than try to rewrite the perfect one 15 times. Uh, so the, the story was, I eventually finished Wizard Quest after those four years. Uh, I basically created it from scratch in like a month or two. Uh, but uh, back then, after struggling for about a year, I decided that the, the Wizard Quest game uh, is my MMORPG. Uh, it wasn't that complicated, but it was uh, pretty much complicated for me back then. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a game in which you were um, a mage fighting with monsters. Uh, there were some stats, uh, you were attacking those monsters with runes. Uh, there was a map and everything and, and it, it was way too, too big to, uh, as, a, as a first pr uh, project for, for one person. Um, so I decided to just drop it and create anything, like anything that would be a working prototype or a working game and in about a week or two, I've created a game which was basically flying in a spaceship and avoiding asteroids, and that's it. Um, so it's one of those very simple, very easy games. Um, and surprisingly enough, it was like 2012 or 2013, uh, it, the game itself got some traction and after I realized I was traveling around the world and, uh, and um, talking to people about uh, how to build HTML5 games, after like having one uh, created in a week. So that's what, that, that was um, pretty interesting and I decided to create more to have like actually games, not a game. Um, so if you're strugg struggling with a project, I would recommend trying something simpler, smaller. Uh, having something that you can create uh, pretty quickly, have a working prototype and work on top of that. Instead of constantly having something that is absolutely not working. Like um, I had a friends who are basically sitting in the basement for like three years 
working on MMORPG, and they were focusing on uh, the equipment system or something else, or like trees, if they should look like this or that. Uh, but they did, at any uh, given point of time, they didn't have a working prototype. They couldn't show me the game or, or anything working. It was just ideas, sketches, some source code that they couldn't even compile or, or, or run. Uh, so the important thing at the, at the very beginning is to realize that you suck. And that was quite important for me. Uh, and there is, there is a knowledge you need to learn to create a game. Um, so the problem is uh, you know what you know, basically. And the more you know about the things you don't know is okay because you can learn about it. The problem is that 90% um, of the stuff is the things you have absolutely no idea they exist and that you have to learn uh, to finish the project. Uh, so um, it resonates with the MMORPG because um, if, if people are starting game development they have absolutely no idea how many things they can screw up in the meantime um, when creating a game and how many things they have to learn in the process. Uh, so you basically have to have a plan. Uh, you can't work like from thinking about the color of the trees to maybe how the equi equipment um, should work. Uh, if you are going to create a game, you basically have to have all the steps uh, documented. Uh, you have to know what you are working on currently and what you want to work next. Uh, and the, uh, the most important thing uh, is, for me I think, uh, is keeping it simple. As simple as possible, if you can start from, uh, from a simple prototype, uh, if you can add uh, some features to the game, um, you can release the game at any given point in time. Uh, so the, the simplicity, at least in the first projects, um, is very important. Uh, because you can, you, you can release something and it's super important uh, to have the experience of finishing a game. Even, even if the game itself is, is really simple, uh, for example, if, um, if I would like to employ someone and I'm checking his GitHub profile or whatever, uh, for me, uh, it's a lot more important to see that someone created five or ten games, even though they are basically very simple, uh, than have the super big project that is not working at all. Um, sometimes it's, it's really hard to, um, to focus on uh, whatever we are building and um, there are no magic tools or, or rules or whatever. Um, if you want to finish what you are building, um, you just have to do it, you just have to focus it. Um, if you do it properly, if you have a plan, uh, if you have a list of features you are doing. Uh, if you iterate on them, uh, it should work. And the, the version you are having, uh, the, for example, the prototype is version 0 0.1. And you can, if you can throw as many things uh, to the next version as possible, that's good because um, again, having a prototype that works uh, is not that obvious um, and you can always take the stuff from the to-do list uh, and um, implement it one by one, basically. Uh, and all the things you would like to have in the game, you basically don't need to have it. You can, you can uh, throw it away and say it will be implemented in the uh, second version of the game. Um, 
and it actually worked a few times uh, for the developers because um, if the game will be successful, if it will end up pretty high in the ranking, uh, this is a free version of the game. They can create uh, a full version, version 2.0, uh, release it on Steam or whatever and earn money and it actually works because the two of the games from uh, last year or two years ago I think um, were so good and so successful that the developers worked a few months on the uh, next versions uh, of the games, so full versions let's call, let's call it, and uh, released it on Steam and they are earning money on those versions which were supposed to be uh, games created for the competition but, uh, but they decided they want to focus on one thing, uh, one feature uh, if this feature will work out, then they can add something more. Uh, it's important to um, tell about the things you are working on uh, because if you like sit in a basement for a month, uh, it won't work. Um, I had this with, uh, with, uh, with Wizard Quest and um, uh, I was so focused on the game, I decided that, that I have to finish it first and then show it to the world. And uh, when, the day, when the release date came, um, I showed it to my friends uh, and after like an hour or two, I got a feedback that um, because in the game, when you play the game, uh, you, are, um, you have to um, tap on the runes which will attack the monsters uh, and so somebody, somebody asked okay so if you smash the buttons or the runes you will pretty quickly win with basically any monster in just a few seconds uh, so I absolutely and totally haven't realized that uh, and the funny thing is, it was just one line of JavaScript that fixed it. So whenever uh, somebody didn't have three or more runes, um, the, the mage was uh, getting, uh, getting hit or getting some damage. Uh, and it was, uh, it was obvious for most of the people, but if you work hard on your, or on your project, on your game, and you focus on it, you can you can omit some obvious things. So it's, it's really important uh, to tell people that you are working on something. Uh, and it also works in a way that um, if you tell someone about the project, they will ask about it later. And I remember there was one or two projects in which um, I didn't want to finish it, but people kept coming and asking about that specific game. I was, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna finish it. Um, and it worked. The, the games are, are earning some, some money, which is, uh, which is cool. Uh, so exposing the project, exposing the game, the work in progress version is, is important to get the feedback, uh, which would be obvious for other people, uh, but doesn't have to be that obvious for you. And you have, you have to test the games. Uh, you have to let other people test the games. Uh, it was similar with Wizard Quest. Um, one, um, one good tester found like 15 or 20 bucks in the game, which I totally omitted. Um, so you have to do that. You have to test uh, uh, as much as possible. And you have to have someone who will test the game for you. Uh, and in the perfect situation, it sounds pretty f funny, but uh, even your mom or someone from the family could be a good tester be because they have absolutely no idea how to play this game, for example. Uh, so it's a good test of the UI if uh, it's obvious how to do something in the game. Uh, if you're not targeting like hardcore players uh, which are playing, I don't know, MMORPGs all their life, uh, it, it's also Im important to, um, to have the UI or, or gameplay or whatever um, as easy to understand as possible. 
the good thing about the competition is that uh, it have a limit. Uh, it lasts for a month and that's it. Uh, it's not going to be expanded. Uh, it's not gonna last one more day or two. Uh, there is a deadline and basically uh, I'm really trying to have people submit the games as soon as possible during the, the 30 days um, by allowing them to possibly earn some more prizes. But um, I'm always ending up with 95% uh, of the games being submitted on the last day, um, which is crazy, but uh, I can totally understand that. Um, there are many cases of developers participating in the competition when they were working on something and um, usually they would just leave the project uh, for later. Uh, if you have like a pet project, you are working from time to time, th this can take like years basically, and you can still not release that. Uh, it's really hard, but with a specific deadline, uh, you just have to chop off something not working or throw away features and um, just submit whatever, more or less. And um, I remember like a few years ago, somebody submitted a game that he was basically totally not happy with. Uh, because it was supposed to have so many cool features. Uh, but the game ended up pretty high anyway. Uh, so even if you think it sucks, if it's working, that's already a lot. <laughs> um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, there are no golden rules. If you uh, really want to finish the project, uh, you just have to focus on it and, and finish it. Uh, if you don't want to, don't do it, basically. Um, if it's working, that's enough. I mean, the judges can play the games, you can call it a finished product, uh, put it on your website and say, and say uh, that's what I planned. And all the other things will be or will not be in the 2.0 version uh, if, if the game will be interestingly enough. If you have free time though, uh, it's important to, to juice it, to add some uh, extra effects, um, have some screen shake effect on shooting bullets or flashes, etc. The, the snake game I mentioned earlier uh, is that it's just a snake game, but by doing some crazy stuff, uh, it looks so good that it ended up on the second place out of 250 games. Uh, I'm gonna show you the game. So um, if you ha have the uh, time to, to polish the game, uh, it's, it's really important because that's the like five or 10 last percent uh, that will uh, make it stand out uh, of the crowd. Uh, okay, so let's see the games. I'm absolutely terrible at playing those games, but, uh, and remember that those are uh, like 13 kilobytes games, so it's, it's, uh, it's a showcase of what you can actually squeeze in something that would be 100 per 200 uh, pixels image. Uh, so this is the, the very first, uh, I mean the, the game from the first edition of the competition. Uh, and the story behind this game is that um, at some point I was testing the games that were submitted for the competition and um, this one came up and after I realized after like two or three hours that I'm still playing the game even though I was supposed to test them like 30 seconds because uh, this uh, was actually the, the first game uh, which looked complete. It, it didn't look like something 
peop, uh, somebody was struggling with uh, to put into the limit. Uh, there is like 13 different levels, a shitload of uh, bonuses and uh, things you can buy, expand, etc., etc. So um, it doesn't look like something created within the limit. Uh, and the game uh, won the 2012 competition. And the guy, in the next year, he created a game in which you just shoot at things, more or less, but the, the whole experience uh, looks a lot better and it feels a lot better than in the usual uh, examples or tutorials. Uh, there are many uh, enemies, you can get some bonuses. Well, I can't get anything right now, but you just have to believe me. Oh, there's something. Ah! Oh, come on. Okay, so you would get some uh, extra firepower or something. Uh, so this is basically a very simple game in which you just shoot at things. Uh, the cool thing is that the screen shake, that the visual effects, sounds and everything make hell of a difference uh, when experiencing the game. Yeah, I can't play that game. Um, in the next years, uh, there was the uh, reversed theme. So, so somebody created a game in which you are the arcade machine and you have to uh, throw the asteroids at the players. Uh, yay. And uh, the funny thing is, uh, you can use uh, WebGL shaders in 13 kilobytes. There is a, a, a person standing, because um, if you are an arcade machine, uh, there is a screen and somebody actually stands in front of the screen and plays the game. So whenever uh, you win, uh, the, the player gets angry and just goes away and the next, player's, next player comes in. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to show you that. Or maybe. Anyway, so your, your task is to get as many coins as possible. Uh, by throwing asteroids at uh, players. So it's again just an asteroids game but with a really cool twist. Um, so in this game you are a taxi driver and basically it's like GTA 1 or 2 uh, within the limit which is pretty crazy. And you just drive around the city Try to <laughs> try to not to kill the customers, basically, uh, and you can even I think change the view of the camera. Um, so it, it's pretty crazy that you can create something within that little amount of space, and it's actually pretty playable <coughs> ah, if you don't die. Um, Beach Buster. So uh, that is a game in which you fix bugs by jumping on them. <laughs> Oops. Oh. Yeah. And yay. And again, it's just a simple platformer. Uh, but with the extra visuals, with, uh, with cool story, it makes a lot of a difference. Um, again, just shooting at stuff, but with extra visuals. So basically, the, the previous game, uh, Glitch Buster, and this game, Evil Glitch, uh, were uh, those two games uh, created two years ago, which uh, developers worked on the post-competition versions uh, because they end up first and the second. 
And uh, those are the games that were late, uh, later uh, released on Steam and are earning uh, some money. Um, and this is the snake game I'll, I told you about in which um, there are no graphics. Everything you are seeing here are emojis. Uh, so the tree is an emoji. There is a squirrel with, uh, um, with some food. Uh, it, it is also an emoji. So the snake is just a yellow block with eyes as emojis. And the, uh, the tongue is just the letter Y. Uh, and the cool thing about the game, there is also music in the background or sounds. Uh, well, you have to eat the apple, which is an emoji. And uh, interestingly enough, the game has like 100 levels. And it gets pretty hard with some crazy uh, things in the meantime. Uh, the 13 kilobyte uh, build have the level editor also, so you can create your own levels for the game. And further in the game, the, the levels got really hard because you can control the snake in like full 3D, go up and down, which is pretty crazy. So uh, yeah, I mean, that is crazy. So the, the last game I want to show you because um, Last year, there was a special category uh, with the A-Frame games. So A-Frame is a framework for uh, building virtual reality experiences for the web. And the A-Frame library was for free. Uh, so you could, it was a special category in which uh, you could use A-Frame and uh, everything else have to be within the 13 kilobytes limit. Um, so it's a, I think it's the first ever flea simulator. Uh, so you're a tiny flea which jumps around and suck blood, basically. Uh, and if you if you learn about the that every single uh, shape or whatever um, was modeled by hand. Like uh, usually you'd use the 3D software to create models. But uh, this uh, was created by hand by putting simple shapes and just checking when, where they are and, and like um, modeling something uh, in the browser, which is crazy. Uh, and yay. The interesting thing is also that uh, there is a secret switch somewhere. If you turn it on or off or whatever, the not so safe for work version is activated. So the, the bikini is disappearing, basically. OK. Uh, OK, so to, to summarize uh, the presentation, if, um, if you would uh, remember um, three things, three key things from the presentation, uh, it would be KISS, keep it simple. Uh, build something that is simple enough so you can have a working prototype uh, and just work on top of that. Keep it simple and keep it simple. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Well, what, what, what do you? Thank you. Uh, do you know the website GS1K? Yes. And uh, so what, what is the reason behind the limitation of 13 kilobytes? Why is it a 
round number to you because I, uh, from demo skin perspective, 4K and 64K are very, very round, yep. 256 bytes, but 13K sounds like a very odd choice. Well, uh, when I created the JS 13K games competition, there was JS 1K, um, there were like Java 4K, uh, there was a bunch of uh, 10K competitions, um, front end ones or, or game dev ones. Uh, and I thought it would be cool to have, have something like JS1K but um, bigger uh, for uh, creating games specifically because uh, you can create a game in one kilobyte but it's really, really hard. So I thought about having maybe 10K but there was a few, uh, few 10K competitions already. So I thought it would be cool to have something more original. Um, so why not 13? And it just stayed there. Um, and um, yeah. Okay, related question is, uh, so you know, uh, you know, so you know GS1K uh, doesn't uh, require you to open source your entries. And it is a very, uh, very good thing that you do require it. But uh, do you see it as something, as a, as a blocker thing? So do you see uh, less people participating because they have to publish their work? Um, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, I had a few cases in which people created the tool uh, which were so important to them that they were asking if they can somehow hide the tool itself and just publish the game or something like that. Uh, well, I have to admit that I'm not checking the, um, I'm not comparing if the submitted version is exactly the same as, the, as what they put on GitHub. Uh, so if they want to cheat, they can do it. But it's the exact same thing with people asking me, okay, so because there are games uh, which don't follow the theme, which is announced the first day, and what if I started working on my game like five months earlier and like do it perfectly, it's not following the theme, but it's so good that it will win anyway. And my answer is like, go ahead, if you want to, spent five months building a game, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna check if the um, files were created before the start of competition or something like that. And if you uh, can change that later on. Yeah, so, um, uh, like, it's, um, it's not that strict. Mm, and it's not a problem, I mean, um, people are participating mostly for fun and uh, if they create something which they think is super important and super secret and they don't want to publish it or submit it, okay, whatever. But uh, uh, even though uh, people were creating games for the competition, submitting the games and taking uh, very high places, um, even though the, the original source code is there, they were still able to um, work on the post-compo versions, uh, release them on Steam, and still get the money out of the sales. Uh, and, like, participating in the competition helped do that. Like, uh, they were known for winning the competition, for example, or they were known in the community already uh, and they were releasing that game that won the competition, for example. So I think it's, um, it's not big of a problem that you have to publish um, the source code on GitHub. And um, I remember somebody said that, uh, okay, so if, if the source code is on GitHub, you will have like a flood of clones of the games that won previously. Uh, so over the six years and 800 games, I had one example in which somebody took a game from like 2013 and it was really very good, very polished, and somebody removed the nice images and put like black squares on, or green squares which were shooting at each other. And it was terrible. And I could immediately see 
that it was the clone of that game. Um, but I decided to accept it anyway. I mean, if you're brave enough to submit something like this, I can send you a t-shirt. So it wasn't, unless it wasn't uh, like 100% clone or stolen code of somebody else, uh, that's fine. I mean, you can remix stuff, right? Okay. Uh, have you ever seen uh, networking entries? Yes, um, there is the server category, uh, which isn't that popular. There are like between five and ten games every single year. Um, there is a special uh, instructions and special backend to, to run the server games, to multiplayer games. Uh, the fun thing about that is that I have absolutely no idea about the server part uh, in general because I'm totally not a backend developer. And at some point I said that I'm gonna um, close this category, but many people said that they still want to build something for, uh, for multiplayer games. And um, we came out, came out with uh, someone actually managing the uh, server category. Uh, so it's still there and it's partially run by, by community, which is super cool. And uh, are they uh, judged in the same? So, so are, are prices uh, based on per category or globally for a year? Uh, the, the prizes are, I mean, um, it's really hard to get new prizes. Like there, there is every single year there are more or less the same prizes, for example, impact JS license or, or like licenses for frameworks, for, uh, for books, etc. There are uh, GitHub licenses. Um, so basically, it's, it's cool that there are, I'm able to get so many prizes uh, that uh, I can cover uh, different categories, uh, add some extra categories or extra ways to win the, the prizes. Uh, because you can you can win uh, prizes by participating in the in the um, in the categories, but there is there are also, for example, social specials. If you submit early, promote the game on Twitter, for example, get uh, the, the the biggest <coughs> amount of, of shares or whatever, you will win some prizes. Um, there is also the the community awards, uh, which is community voting for their own games, uh, which is also awarded uh, with prizes. Uh, so the, the good thing about having so many prizes is that I can distribute them to, to different categories and award as many people as possible. Because I don't want to give all of the prizes to the like the best game, uh, but um, the more um, licenses or whatever, the better. For example, if I have like 30 GitHub uh, coupons, I can award best uh, 30 games from the community awards, for example. Uh, I see. And uh, do you, uh, have you seen a game using peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication methods, WebRTC, for example? So it's, so there would be, it would be possible in 13K probably to uh, write uh, serverless multiplayer games. Probably niche. Probably it could be possible. I mean, I, I'm not exactly sure what are the rules of the server category right now. Uh, I think there is a, you, you deploy an instance on the Heroku and just uh, somehow communicate, but um, I'm not even sure how the communication work with the current setup. So um, you could, Create something. Well, I mean, you can you can uh, for the single player or for the desktop for the normal category, you can create multiplayer games in which two people just sit at one computer. It's it's still multiplayer, right? So um, you can absolutely use probably you can use uh, WebRTC. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Anybody else? Any any other questions? Yeah, so what will be the team this year? <laughs> uh, it's a secret. <laughs> Virtually we are being recorded. We can beep it out or something. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, over the years, I, 
well, besides my wife, basically, uh, I haven't told anyone about the Vim before it was announced. <laughs> it's a secret. Yep. Yeah, what's the bare minimum to get a free T-shirt? Sorry? <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't heard. What's the bare minimum to get a free T-shirt? Uh, well, if you want to get a free T-shirt, you just have to submit anything, basically. Uh, yeah. But like anything, just a NPM, HTML file, or <laughs> at least you have some basic rules for it. Any game, basically. I mean, if you are not stealing the source code which is there, which happened like last year, um, if you create anything from, from a tutorial or whatever, if you add something from you, it's, it, it should be perfectly fine. I mean, um, I really love sending the t-shirts, even though it, 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 it is hard if you have like 250 addresses. Um, but I'm, um, last year was the first year when I actually had to reject some entries. Um, if the game is not stolen, then I'll probably accept it. There were like stupid games, ugly games, terrible games, uh, something that you but I wasn't even sure if it's a game or a visual experience or something. I still accepted it. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's pretty easy to, to submit anything and you will probably get a t-shirt. You know, there is this thing uh, uh, on GitHub, the Hacktoberfest, and they have a uh, you have to submit four pull requests for a t-shirt. I have some friends at GitHub who actually tell me all the crazy and, and creepy stories of people. What, what, uh, what can people do for, for a free t-shirt? So, <laughs> people can do a lot for a free t-shirt. Well, you can actually write a post-mortem of creating the game and submit uh, the pull request to the uh, resources page with the link to it and it will count as a accepted pull request during Hacktoberfest. Yeah, if you consider success, successful games, uh, are those made by teams or by probably by single individuals also? Uh, so um, currently um, there is no way to uh,